want to encourage you to grab your Bibles and open up to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark. You know, the last few Sundays have been phenomenal together with Palm Sunday, Easter Sunday. Wasn't it great to have Pastor Fidel with us last Sunday? Um, man, love Pastor Fidel. He has been a longtime friend of our church, and it was just such a joy to have him on that Saturday with the guys for the breakfast, and then last Sunday giving up just a great message that your test can truly become your testimony. And just heard so much wonderful feedback from our church about how that, that message specifically just ministered to so many of us. So if you missed any of those teachings or those times, you can find them online if you'd like to reference them. But this morning, we are going to be back in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 3. So let me open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll begin to jump back into this book. You guys doing okay? Yes. You look good. You're a good-looking church. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful morning. It's just a, uh, Lord, this time of year in Northwest Florida, it's kind of a joy to wake up and almost taste the sweetness of the air. It's uh, just a sweet time of year as far as the weather's concerned. Um, but Lord, I'm so thankful just for the season that we've just celebrated. To be reminded, Lord, that we have a sweetness of soul because you're alive. Jesus, we just worshiped together over the last few weeks that we truly worship and know a risen Savior. God, you've given us your Holy Spirit. You've invited us into a living and vibrant relationship with you. And so, Lord, this morning as we open up your word, we believe that your word is living and active, that your word has the ability like, un like unto nothing else to speak to us. So, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open to your word, that you'd give us ears to hear Jesus, as you so often said. Lord, that our minds would be attentive to what you want to share to us. And, Lord, that you would just um, have your rule and reign in our hearts and lives this morning as we study your word. God, we love you. We pray this in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we're working our way together as a church through the Gospel of Mark. And we've seen throughout this Gospel that in the account of the life of Jesus, Mark's intent is truly to jolt those who are reading this account into a clear understanding of who Jesus is. Pop quiz. Would you say that in our culture, there seems to be a misunderstanding quite often to who Jesus is? Some people, yeah, they want to define Jesus in their own terms or in their own way. Well, the Gospel of Mark very clearly, from right out of the gate, in a way that kind of jolts us into an understanding of who he is, gives us an understanding of who Jesus is. And he moves, he moves so quickly through the life of Jesus. He begins with an announcement of who Jesus is. Chapter 1, verse 1, Mark says, this is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Is there any ambiguity there who Jesus is? This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And it's been a few weeks since we've been in this book together, so let me just remind you what he means by using that terminology. This is the good news, he said. That's a word that for us has become familiar about the gospel of Jesus, but it was a common word in that day, the Greek word evangelion, just meant an announcement that had something to do with a proclamation of someone who was in authority. And that day, in that time in which this was written, it would have been about the emperor. So by Mark saying, this is the evangelion, the good news about Jesus, he's making a very bold, a very clear, a very jolting statement that Jesus is royalty. He's king. Mark doesn't open his gospel with a, a description, but a declaration. Jesus is royalty. He's king. And the second thing he says, he's Messiah. The Jews had been waiting for this, for the Messiah, one who, like Moses, a prophet, would speak boldly on behalf of God, and that would come from that blessed line of David. King David, who would establish a kingdom that would last forever. And Mark, as he opens up his gospel, he doesn't hold anything back. 
It's not like he's trying to say, well, this is who Jesus is. Maybe interpret him in your own language and your own perspective from your own story. No, he says, this is Jesus, the good news about him, the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus is king. Jesus is Messiah, the one who's been promised. Jesus is the Son of God. And he shares in that first chapter what his message is. Judge not lest you not be judged. That's his only message. No. Verse 15 of chapter 1, Jesus says this, the time promised by God has come at last. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. That was the crux of Jesus' message everywhere he went. The kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God in your life begins now, is what he's saying. Come to him. Come under his rule. Come under his reign, leaving your old life, stepping into his by believing. Believing? Yeah, resting in, reposing in, having your heart find ease in the truth of who Jesus is. And that's what we see throughout the Gospel of Mark, that Jesus is king, that he's Messiah, that he's God, that his kingdom is now. The, the rule and reign of him in your life begins as you repent and believe. And in chapter 1, as Mark's doing just with that first verse, kind of running out of the gate in this declaration of who Jesus is, well, we see in chapter 1 that this reality that Jesus is king, that he's Messiah, that he's son of God, it's on display. That there's like this undeniable authority. In that first chapter, you see this reality that this is affirmed by the Old Testament prophets, by that, that wild forerunner of Jesus, John the Baptist, eating locusts and honey and wearing camel's hair. It's affirmed by the Holy Spirit of God and God the Father himself in an audible voice at the baptism of Jesus saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Is there any ambiguity at all of who Jesus is from chapter one of the gospel of Mark? Mark declares it. And then throughout that chapter, who Jesus is as Messiah, as a king, as the Son of God, it's validated, it's affirmed, it's pronounced, it's declared, it's certified. This is who Jesus is. But in chapter 2 and in chapter 3, where we are this morning, it's interesting. Not everyone's excited about that announcement of who Jesus is. In chapter 2 and this morning in chapter 3, Mark begins to highlight, like story after story, five consecutive to be, to be exact, accounts where there's conflict with Jesus and those who would have been seen at that time in very high regard, the religious leaders. Jesus had healed a paralyzed man. Remember that story where Jesus is in a house where it's packed, it's a small place, maybe, maybe 40 to 50 people are packed into the house and the roof begins to come apart. And these friends of this guy named Matt, we'll call him, lower him down on a mat. And Jesus says something that would have startled everyone there and maybe freaked out the guys who are on the roof. Hey, son, your sins are forgiven. The religious leaders are there and they're like, wait a second, only God can do that. And Jesus makes a statement, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or right now stand up and walk. And to prove that he was the one who had this authority to forgive sins, he tells the man to stand up and to walk. And the religious leaders are frizzled, frazzled, frustrated by this. It's got to show you something about their heart. A man is just healed. Someone who cannot walk. And these men are angry about it. Jesus is Messiah. He's the king. He's the son of God. But we begin to see in chapter 2 and chapter 3 that the religious leaders, they're in conflict with Jesus. We saw elsewhere in chapter 2 that Jesus would eat with those people who are the regular people of the day those who are actually far from God, not to just identify with them and 
and throw back a drink, but to reach them. And do you remember how the religious leaders responded to this? It's in verse 16 of chapter 2. It says, when the teachers of the religious law who were Pharisees saw him eating, eating with tax collectors and other sinners, he asked, why does he eat with such scum? Can you imagine a pastor of a church saying that to someone? Like, uh, eat with such scum. Jesus' response in that chapter, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they're righteous, but those who know they're sinners. There's such tension happening between Jesus and the religious leaders. Last time we were in this book together, Pastor John shared about that story in chapter 2 where Jesus' disciples were questioned why they don't fast and how they could kind of pick wheat on a Sabbath day and grind it together, which they saw the religious leaders as, as work and breaking the Sabbath. And where we pick up the account in Mark this morning, I, I'm saying all this to share with you the sense of the text that you're about to step into. Tensions are high. Things are getting thick between Jesus and those that many put in a very elevated light, the religious leaders. But there's a lot of tension brewing. We often see the, the religious leaders in a very negative light, right? Right? Like when you read about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the priests, we're almost preconditioned to think those are just the bad guys in the culture. But for most of those who would have grown up there in Israel, when you would have seen a Pharisee or a Sadducee, you, you held those guys in high respect. You thought, well, they're the ones that study the law. They're the ones that know what they share must be right. But tension is brewing amongst Jesus and the religious leaders. And look at verse 1 of chapter 3. I'll read from the New Living Translation. This is what it says. Jesus went into the synagogue again. Remember the last time we saw him in the synagogue? And he noticed a man with a deformed hand. Now, the context is clear. We know who Jesus is, right? He's the king. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. It's clear what he's calling people to. Come into the kingdom of God, the rule and reign of God in your life. We know that the religious elite are not having this. And you could kind of be tempted to just breeze over the tension that's there in verse 1, but it's there. Jesus goes into the synagogue again, Mark says. It's his rhythm. It's Sabbath, so it's like a Sunday for us. You go to church, so to speak. And as he's there, he notices this man with a deformed hand. And look at what Mark records for us about the tension of this moment in verse 2. Since it was Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. See, the religious leaders have already taken issue with Jesus' disciples about the Sabbath. Now he's in a synagogue on the Sabbath day. They're watching him closely. Is he going to break their traditions? Let me say that again. Their traditions. What's culturally acceptable to them and for them? What do you mean by that? Well, the Sabbath was designed by God to be a holy day. Let me read to you from the book of Exodus about what God says about this day and how they were to keep it. In chapter 3, it says this, You must keep the Sabbath day, for is it a holy day for you? Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. So if you were to do something to desecrate the Sabbath day, it wasn't a slap on the wrists. This was a death sentence. Anyone who works on that day shall be cut off from the community. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day must be a Sabbath day of complete rest, a holy day dedicated to the Lord. Anyone who works on Sabbath must be put to death. The people of Israel must keep the Sabbath day by observing it from generation to generation. Pass this on to your kids. Make sure they know the importance of this day. 
He says, this is a covenant obligation for all time. It's a permanent sign of my covenant with the people of Israel. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. But on the seventh day, he stopped working and was refreshed. Sabbath was serious, not meant to be burdensome. It was meant to be a blessing to God's people, but also a banner. You say, what do you mean by that? They belong to God. It was meant to be a way in which identified, set them apart from those who were around them. It wasn't something that they were meant to dread, but to delight in, to rest, and to evidence that, that work didn't dominate God's people. God led his people. But the religious leaders had added such heavy weights to the meaning of rest that Sabbath for many in that day and time didn't equal rest but stress. And the religious leaders, so to speak, had missed the forest for the trees. There's a man in their midst who has an issue. And there's no compassion whatsoever. There's just a critical eye. Because of their interpretation of the Sabbath in a very legalistic way, when there was hurt or pain, if the guy wasn't dying, well, then let's just wait till the next day. That was their interpretation of the law. If life was endangered or if injury would worsen, the community could intervene otherwise. No work could be done on the Sabbath. Here's something I want you to hear. This was their tradition, the expectation of those who were around them. But that specifically was not found in Scripture, that definition of work. There's so much tension in the room as Jesus walks into that synagogue. Things have been brewing between Jesus, Jesus' disciples, and the religious leaders. And I don't know. I, let me just set myself in the sandals of the situation. If I were Jesus and I knew things were tense amongst those religious leaders and I'm walking into synagogue and I see that there's a man in pain and I could do something about it and I see all those religious leaders around, I might be tempted to say, hey, why don't we connect after church, right? I'd love to pray with you. Maybe, maybe text or email me this week and we can get together and, and I can do something about that hand, Right? What does Jesus do? Look at verse 3. Look at what he does with all the tension that's brewing. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, why don't you come and stand in front of everyone? Do you sense the tension in the room? The boldness of Jesus. Remember, he's the king, he's the Messiah, he's God. He's deliberately using this occasion. Could have done it the next day, could have done it privately, could have chosen to do this at a different time and place. But what he's about to say is so significant. He turns, it says in verse 4, to his critics, and he says this. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But Mark records they would not answer him. See, Jesus is brilliant here. He, he frames this whole scenario with kind of like clear-cut extremes. They're looking to see if they can trip up Jesus on kind of a legal technicality. Is he going to heal on the Sabbath? Something that goes against their interpretation of what God wants? And Jesus takes this scenario out of this legal technicality to the heart of it. He says, listen, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Is today a day for good or for evil, to save life or to destroy it? What's he doing? He's calling them to examine their traditions, their perspective of who God is, and is it consistent with what God actually says? The obvious answer here Failure to do good, to save life, was wrong. That's not in all keeping with who God is and what he wants. But Mark tells us they don't say a word. They don't say a word. By refusing to answer, it's like they're saying and they're showing their views, their practices, their traditions, 
They know they're off, but they're not going to say anything about it. They don't answer. They, they just kind of become more steeped in their view, their opinion, their perspective than what's really right. And how does Jesus respond to this? Look at verse 5. It says, this is such an interesting verse. He looked around at them angrily and was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. They don't respond. It's like they know they're wrong. And instead of a repentance, instead of a changing of mind, they harden. Church, I, I, I hope you hear me on this. This is a very dangerous place to be. For God to speak to your heart and for you to harden, to not respond. So Jesus is what we would call mad sad, right? He's mad because there's a man here who's hurting and they're more concerned with their reputation and what their peers would think of how they would respond in that moment. And he's sad because this was an opportunity. This was an opportunity for them to change their minds and to simply align their perspective with truth. And so he simply says a word in this moment. Look at what it says there. Hold out your hand. That's all he says. It doesn't appear that Jesus has to do some kind of physical effort or work. It doesn't appear that he gets his disciples involved in any way. He simply says a word, and the Bible tells us that the man held out his hand, and it was restored. Restored. This man does something that he can't do. Again, if I set myself in that situation, I might have responded to Jesus. Well, Jesus, if you can heal this, then I'll do it. No, that man, by faith, by trust and obedience, he simply does what Jesus says, and his hand is restored. How does all that work? Can I be honest with you? I don't know how healing works, but I know that God heals. I know he does. I've seen him do it. I want to encourage you to be a part of our time together this Wednesday. Pastor John will share an amazing teaching on the biblical perspective of healing and then give opportunity for us to pray for God to heal. And I don't understand the mind and the ways of God completely. I love Pastor Chuck Smith, something he once said about God's word. He says, where God's word, and I'll put it in the NIV, Neil's interesting version, but where, where God's word speaks, I'll speak. But where God's word is silent, I'm going to be silent. And I've seen God heal in a moment by simply an obedience to God's word, like it says in the book of James, just anointing with oil and praying, and there's healing. I've seen God bring healing through the gift of medicine. We live in such a beautiful time in the 21st century. We're given such amazing medical care where God can use the wisdom and the resources and the application of those things to bring healing. And I also have seen him say no. But I know that he heals. I know that he heals. And this man who doesn't have any kind of religious pedigree. It's so tempting for us to, to kind of always just look down on the Pharisees, Sadducees. Those in that day did not. Those are like the elevator. Those are the tip of the spear guys. This guy with the deformed hand in the synagogue, he didn't have a religious pedigree, but you know what he had? Humility and faith. Listen, you can win in those categories in life. Trust and humility and those are the ingredients by which God does amazing things in your life. The man has humility and faith. So, you know, on that day, he walks out of the synagogue healed. These critics, the Pharisees, here's something I want to share. In their hardened hearts, and as they continue to harden their hearts, they make a choice that they would probably have never seen themselves do if they would have rewinded the clock in their life. Say, so what do you mean by that? Look at verse 6. It says, At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Let me say two things about this. This is bizarre behavior. The Pharisees are ready to murder on the Sabbath 
because Jesus heals on the Sabbath. I don't know all these Pharisees, scribes. I don't know anything about their background. But my assumption is that at least some of these guys, early in their life, they, they probably started out with a sense to want to know God and to worship him. These were individuals that had dedicated their lives to knowing God's word and to living it out. But their hearts hardened when Jesus spoke to them and they didn't respond. Let me say something about this. Let me put it in a way that someone else once put it. Sin always takes you farther than you want to go. Sin always keeps you longer than you want to stay. And sin always costs you more than you're able to pay. Sin in a hardened heart will lead you to become someone that you eventually don't even recognize. And I doubt these religious leaders, when they set out at 13, that that would be the age that they would begin to train to become one of these religious leaders. I doubt that when they set out at that young age to be leaders in their community, wanted to end up there where they're plotting murder on a Sabbath day. Do you get the bizarreness of this scene? Jesus is providing healing, good on that day. And these religious leaders, because of their hardened hearts, have gone to the opposite end of the spectrum. That's what sin does. But also, what's weird about verse 6 is that the Pharisees are so upset that there's such a hardness of heart that they begin to connect with the supporters of Herod, it says, the, the Herodians. Now, what's up with that? Now, I'm not a college football guy, but I know enough that this is kind of weird, that if your neighbor, when it's college football season, were to hang this flag in his front yard, you would go, that guy doesn't know what he's doing, right? <laughs> like, those things don't go together. Is that right? Like, those aren't two teams that usually hang out. Is that true? Yeah, okay. Those are things that don't mix, right? Those are opposing teams. Well, the Herodians, they were not a religious party. They were a group of Jews who were sympathetic to King Herod. King Herod, which if you've ever read the Bible, you know that most of the Jewish people, they hated the rule of King Herod. They despised him. They only obeyed his laws reluctantly. To support King Herod in the mind of a Pharisee? Are you nuts? The Pharisees were about the independence of God's people. That's why they're looking for Messiah to come in and to, to destroy, destroy all those who would come against them. But here's what happens. The Herodians and the Pharisees come together because of their hatred of Jesus. He threatened their political and their religious places of prestige. And sin and a hardness of heart will lead you to do things that you could have never dreamed of, but also, but also put you in a place where you begin becoming comfortable around people you shouldn't. The Pharisees and the Herodians would have nothing to do with one another, but their hardness of heart led to unholy alliances. Now listen, there are a lot of takeaways from just these six verses of what Mark is giving us as an account for the synagogue Sabbath scenario. But I want you to linger upon this one thing. Repent from sin when it's convenient. That's the thing I want you to catch from this text. Re repent from sin when, when you're ready. Okay, let's move on. No. <laughs> repent from sin now. Can we all say now together? That is the best time to repent from sin. When God speaks to your heart, respond. Respond. You know this if you've read the Old Testament. When God was calling Israel to be let go from Pharaoh's grasp, and it says over and over again that Pharaoh hardened his heart. In the latter times, it says that then God allowed his heart to remain hard. It's this interesting thing about how God, when he speaks to you, that if you choose to continue to disobey, he will eventually allow you to stay in that place. I mean, we always look at these Pharisees with this negative light. And don't get me wrong, we should. They're against Jesus. But did they start that way? I don't know. But sin and a hardness of heart led these individuals who were committed to know God's word, right? Right? 
committed to follow it as their community interpreted it. But when the truth of God's word is Jesus is illuminating it to them there in that place is being lit up in their hearts, they don't say anything. They don't respond. And they find themselves beginning to do and to be with those they would have never set out to do or be with because there was no repentance. You see, it's not that Jesus wasn't honoring God's standards for the Sabbath. It's not that Jesus is against rules. Don't misunderstand what's happening here. He's all for following God's word. He was giving an opportunity for those who looked like they were close to God, coming to Sabbath, coming to synagogue on Sabbath, outwardly obeying, even involved in serving and being seen, giving them an opportunity to move from a calloused heart to a loving, compassionate heart for God and people. Do you find yourself critic, calloused? Here's what I'd say. Repent. Turn to him. Ask the Lord to change your heart by giving your heart afresh to Jesus. Someone once said this, it's a very dangerous thing to know about Jesus, but don't turn your hearts toward him in love. You can actually leave church in a worse condition than when you came into church. What he means by that is for God to speak to your heart. And you just kind of, no, I'm not going to respond. It's not convenient. I'm not going to do that. You've heard me say this so many times, but that, that famous preacher, Billy Graham, once said, one of the most dangerous things a Christian can do is to go to church on Sunday, to just become familiar with things that are holy, to allow God's word to be spoken and, and, and not allow it to penetrate your heart to have there be no change, no application, just have it be more information. It's a dangerous place to be. Jesus was after their hearts, and they wouldn't have it. Now they're after him, right? He's number one on their hit list. The Pharisees, the Herodians are after him. So what does he do? Does he begin to back off? Does he say, okay, no more calling those who need me out front and center. That was a bad move. I'm not doing that anymore. What happens? Well, look at verse 7. It says, he goes out to the lake with his disciples, and a large crowd followed him. Jesus leaves the synagogue, but he doesn't leave his calling to seek and save the lost. He continues to be about his father's business. Large crowds are following him from all over the place. Mark continues to write there in verse 7 that they came from Galilee, Judea, Jerusalem, Udemia, from the east of the Jordan River, from even as far north as Tyre and Sidon, and the news about his miracles had spread far and wide. Vast numbers of people are coming to see him. Crowds are coming from everywhere. His popularity is peaking. So what does he do? Verse 9, instructs his disciples. Hey, have a boat ready so that the crowd would not crush him. He healed many people that day so that all the sick people eagerly pushed forward to touch him. Mark provides an insight here that the other gospel writers don't, that he has this little boat, almost like a a rowboat at the ready. And as he's walking along the shoreline, crowds are pressing up against him. You can kind of get the picture of people crowding around, shoving each other, reaching out to Jesus, desperate to be healed. And what does Jesus tell his disciples? Boys, it's time for a Galilee getaway, (laughs) a day off for the disciples. People are hunting us. People want something from us. No, it's not what he does. He heals them. He, He makes a way for himself to be available to them, even though it's challenging and chaotic. And in verse 11, it would seem that the scene begins to get wild. Look at verse 11. Whenever those possessed by evil spirits caught sight of him, The spirits would throw them to the ground in front of him. Listen to this description. Shrieking, you're the son of God. People, not just any people, but the religious and political elite are out to kill Jesus. Crowds are following him everywhere, so much so that they're like pushing him into the water. Gets a little rowboat to to preach and teach from. As those who are possessed by evil spirits see him, they're shrieking. I have an audio clip of what shrieking sounds like. No, I don't, but wouldn't that? But it's not a pleasant thing, right? They're shrieking. Jesus, you're the son of God. 
In the midst of all of this, he's making a way for himself to be available, even though it's chaotic and challenging. But there's one thing he won't allow. Verse 12. He sternly commanded the spirits not to reveal who he was. Isn't there this dynamic amongst some that, hey, all press is good press, even if it's bad press? Jesus doesn't seem to buy into that. Why doesn't he want this press from the possessed spirits? They're not falling down in worship, but shrieking to everyone, you're the son of God. And Jesus didn't want or need demons to endorse him. You know what was enough? The resurrection. That's where he wanted to prove once and for all who he is. Jesus, and this is just my opinion, didn't want to reinforce this popular misconception that the crowds were looking for. Well, like a political and military leader to free him from Rome. He wanted people to see who he was as a Messiah. A Messiah whose kingdom was spiritual. One author puts it this way. Jesus' kingdom is spiritual. It begins not with the overthrow of governments, but with the overthrow of sin in people's hearts. Listen, we're almost done, but I'm hoping that you're catching the heartbeat of this chapter. Jesus is after the hearts of you and me. That's why he's here, to seek and to save the lost. He's in the synagogue. The religious leaders, they're like on tiptoe, hoping to be able to accuse him of something that they can put him to death for. He's healing a man. Jesus is by the lake. Crowds are thronging around him so much so that they're pushing him into the water. Evil spirits are shrieking about him. He's healing people. He's healing people. As we close our time this morning, we've seen that his tension is at an all-time high in the life of Jesus. He's rejected and targeted by these religious leaders. Crowds are everywhere. Demons are going nuts. What does Jesus do? Look at verse 13. Jesus went up to a mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him. And they came to him. And he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles. Jesus is at a very critical point in his life and ministry. He's offended the traditions of the religious elite. The crowds are, are after him, but not really interested in spiritual things. They're, they're fickle. So he goes to a mountain. We know from another writer, the Gospel of Luke, that he spent the whole night in prayer as he was on that mountain. And he calls those that he wanted to disciple, to, to learn and to apprentice from him. And probably only second to what Jesus accomplished on the cross and through his resurrection, there seems to be nothing more important and predominant in the ministry of Jesus than choosing these 12 men to be his disciples. Pastor David Guzik says this, that these were the men who would carry out and carry on what he started. Without them, the work of Jesus would never extend to the whole world. With all that's going on, Jesus chooses these 12 men. And notice how he raises them up. He chooses them. He chooses them. He chooses them. That's the first thing Jesus does when he wants to call someone, a disciple. He chooses them. And I want to say this. That happens today. Jesus chooses us to follow him. Now, you might be here this morning and say, that seems a little confusing. Didn't I choose him? Yes, you did. But he chose you. He chose us first. You might say, I didn't know that he chose me. That's okay. In the big picture, the reason we chose him is because he first chose us. This isn't mean to bring confusion, but comfort. Jesus chose you to follow him. He loves you. He cares for you. He wants you. He chose you, knowing who you are and what he wants to do through you. And then in verses 14 and 15, we see what being chosen by Jesus looks like for these 12 disciples and for us. Look at what it says there. They were to accompany him, 
and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. Three things here. They were to accompany him. I love how some translations say they were to just be with Jesus. They were to be with him. First and foremost, following Jesus is being with Jesus and recognizing his involvement in your life, in everything that you do. As I wake up, I'm with Jesus. As I go to work, I'm with Jesus. I'm with Jesus, and he is with me. I thought this was so insightful, so simple. I wanted to put it up on the screen about what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Recognize the presence of Jesus in your life every day. I am with you and you are with me throughout the day. This is fundamentally what it means to be a disciple. Being a disciple is not about belonging to a certain church, but first and foremost about belonging to Jesus. This reality of recognizing that he is with you. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He sees the end from the beginning and the beginning to the end. God's working in your life. And the most reliable way to know him, to seek him, is through the word of God. The mind, the will, the personality of Jesus is revealed to us through God's word. As one pastor said, You will be in the school of discipleship of Jesus as you recognize that he is with you and you are with him and you simply spend time in his word. Recognizing his presence and understanding who he is through his word, Jesus chooses his disciples to be with him. And what does it say he does from there? It says that he would send them out to preach. Here's the point. He gave them something to do. It wasn't just about being with him, but he gave them something active to do. Being a disciple, it's somewhat of a passive thing. Man, I'm with Jesus. I'm just abiding in him. But it's also a very active thing. Jesus has something for you to do. Something for you to do in your church, in your community, in your home. When the Apostle Paul was was writing to the early church, he wrote this in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There's different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does the work in us all. Listen to this verse, verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 12. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Being a disciple of Jesus, here's what it looks like. You're called. You're chosen. You're with Jesus. And he has something for you to do. But also, he empowers you to do it. Look at verse 15. Giving them authority to cast out demons. He was calling them to something that he would empower them to do. This is true for you and I. Whatever Jesus calls us to do, he will empower us to do, and he'll give you something to do that you have to depend upon him in order to accomplish. Where you say, God, I need your resources, your spirit to move for what you're calling me to do with my life in service to you. See, the elements of being a disciple of Jesus, there's four of them here in this section. You're called. You're with Jesus. You're given something to do, and you're empowered to do the things that you could never do on your own. And here's what I love about the disciples of Jesus. Regular guys. The names of the 12 that are mentioned here, look at verses 16 through 19, and here's where we'll close. These are the 12 he chose. Simon, who he named Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, I love this. But Jesus nicknamed them the sons of thunder. What kind of personality do you got to have for Jesus to go, you know who you guys are? You're the sons of thunder. Verse 18, Andrew and Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, who's the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him. There's a lot of connections in this group. There's brothers, right? There's James and John. There's Peter and Andrew. Andrew. 
There's guys that maybe work together in business. Peter, James, and John were all fishermen. There's political opponents. Matthew, the Roman collaborating tax collector, and Simon, the Roman-hating zealot. And there's one who would betray Jesus, Judas. It's interesting. We know some things about some of these guys, right? Peter and James and John and what we read about Judas and all the different things we see happen that in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, God did amazing things through these men. But here's the thing I want to draw your attention to. For the most part, we know very little, at least about these other eight guys that are mentioned in this list. And I think one of the biggest traps in our world today it seems like everyone wants to become some kind of famous, to be known for something. But in this life, that is fleeting and passing. But these men, of whom we know very little about for most of them, their names in heaven, Revelation 21 tells us that their names are on the very foundation of the new Jerusalem. They're known in heaven. And here's what I would say. The fame of our name, what we're seeking that'll bring the most fulfillment in life is to hear these words of Jesus one day. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's our aim as disciples. Listen, as we look at this section in Mark chapter 3 this morning, I hope you see and you hear the heartbeat of what's happening in this passage. Jesus is after the hearts of people. Those religious leaders in that day followed their traditions. Seems like they valued their position over the condition of their heart. The crowds are there, but they don't seem to be really interested in spiritual things. They're fickle. Jesus calls these 12 disciples, and he does the same thing for us today. As disciples, we're chosen by Jesus. We're with Jesus. He gives us something to do, and he empowers us to do it. But, but the heartbeat of what I hope you catch from this morning is that Jesus is after your heart. He's after your heart. And as he speaks to your heart, the best time to respond to what the Lord speaks to in your life is now. To come to him. To not allow there to be this dynamic like these religious leaders where you value something, your position over the condition of your own heart, but to allow Jesus into your heart. Not just one day, but every day. Repentance is somewhat of a lifestyle for a believer where you're constantly aligning your heart, your attitude, your mindset into what the Lord wants for your life. I want to encourage you as we close in a time of worship this morning to come to Jesus. Recognize as a disciple of his that he's chosen you. He wants you to be with him. He's given you something to do and he's empowered you to do it. But allow your heart to be soft in his hands. Don't harden your heart, but allow your heart to be changed as you give it afresh to Jesus this morning.